truth. I call that the river of endless love. You want that experience of intimacy to go on, right? You don't want it to be a hookup, you know, a one-shot deal. My parents' marriage lasted until the heart attack of my dad at the age of 57. You know, over 30 years they lasted. Their marriage lasted. Why? Well, for one thing, they trusted in Christ and they allowed the Spirit to move their hearts, their hearts to the heart of Christ. Endless love. It's no accident that at ground zero, the World Trade Center went, but the cross of Jesus Christ was there. A piece of steel in the form of a cross was rescued by some heroic people and planted. One of the Pentecostal preachers there with me, Dr. Michael Haynes from Temple, Texas, was so proud that his organization was largely responsible for planting that piece of steel to remind all of us that Jesus will never leave us orphaned. Endless love. Truth. Truth is not a head trip. Truth is a person, Jesus Christ. And how many people come to Catholicism because they want the truth? They don't want a lot of baloney, a lot of political correct, a correct babble. They want something you could sink your teeth into. And what can we sink our teeth into with more depth and substance than the Holy Eucharist? Amen? Endless love. My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. Remember, I received my mom into the Catholic Church because she wanted to know what's it all about, Alfie? What is true? Goodness. I, and the Bible tells me so. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. I wonder if I have my stupid thing here in my uh, pocket. I, oh, yes, it is. Here's the stupid gadget. I just bought an iPhone 4S. Aren't I hip? It's the latest iPhone. Well, I think it's already outdated by the iPhone 5. And yet, this will go, but this will never go because these are the words of eternal life, truth. Goodness, I call that the river of sacrificial love, the good shepherd who lays down his life for his friends, right there at the cross. Goodness. My parents had to get up in the middle of the night to take care of me, a, an asthmatic child. Anybody who's married knows that it's not a, a bowl of cherries. It's not a piece of cake. But anybody who makes any commitment whatsoever, you know you have to deny yourself. Maybe that's why people are afraid to marry. Maybe there are so many people living together because they're afraid of that sacrifice. And anybody here have children? You know what I'm talking about. One of the most inspiring things I do is to visit the homebound. I hope to visit some of your homebound during this mission. And to see spouses taking care of Spouses with Alzheimer's disease, even though they don't even know who their spouse is, the, the, the sick uh, spouse, doesn't even know who her husband or his wife is. Nevertheless, that spouse will take care of him or her because Christ is there. Amen? And so many people, you know what I'm talking about, you who have children who are off in orbit, you stick with them, you keep on keeping on because you know that ultimately Christ will conquer. And he will be there. And his love is eternal and endless and sacrificial. He lays down his life for his friends. And finally, beauty. It wasn't very beautiful to be at ground zero. And yet, when you looked at the sky, it was beautiful. And when you looked at the cross, there was beauty. One of the things I do in Tennessee when I go back is to work with the men and women on death row. And executions are horrible. Calvary was horrible. But that's a beautiful cross that I have. And probably some of you are wearing jewelry in the form of a crucifix because we know that corruptibility will be clothed with incorruptibility. In heaven there is no Avon or Mary Kay. But there at that pit at ground zero, Ash after ash. That's what it was. 
That's what we were blessing, bone and ash. But does it end there, or do we go from ashes to Easter? We not only go from ashes to Easter, but we go to Pentecost. And we know that the Holy Spirit, who glorified the body of Jesus Christ, will glorify our mortal bodies as well. St. Paul. And so, unity, truth, goodness, and beauty, universal love. The love of all creatures of our God and King, this beautiful planet on which we live. So those are the four rivers, and that's what brought Isaac Hecker not only to Christ, but to the Catholic Church. He called Catholicism the fullness of unity, truth, goodness, and beauty. And he got those four hungers and thirsts from the transcendentalist, because we're all thirsting and hungering for absolute love intimate, endless, sacrificial, and universal. Which is why I have my very good friend, the woman at the well. See her up there? There she is, one of my favorite characters. I bought that particular statue, that image, in Bethlehem. Uh, and I carry her with me all over the place, because she has everything. She was hungering and thirsting for all of the above. Intimacy. There she meets a man, but she doesn't know who that man is. Because in those days, men and women didn't associate in public, as they still don't in some countries. Give me a drink. You? A Jew speaking to me, a Samaritan? Hostility worse than that between Israelis and Palestinians in some quarters today. You a man speaking to me, a woman? Well, then give, ask me for a drink, and I'll give you living water. Well, what's that all about? Living water. You don't even have a bucket. Running water. What, what is that? This well is deep. You think you're better than Jacob? And by the way, when you read the New Testament, you got to read it with a kind of a Jewish lilt, a Jewish spin. You know, as if you're Bette Midler or Henny Youngman, okay. or Joan Rivers or the Marx Brothers. Listen, you're going to be thirsty again, right? Right. But you think you're better than Jacob? He doesn't let on that he's the God of Jacob. Listen, you're going to come back here again. But the water that I will give to you will bubble up and become living water, bubbling up unto eternal life. Now notice her attitude starts to change because as soon as Christ comes into our lives, our attitudes change. Do you ever meet someone with an attitude? She's changed. Give me this water, sir. Her heart now is drawn to the heart of Christ. Brothers and sisters, isn't that what's lacking in so many of us Catholics? We're all up here. It's all a routine. We don't listen enough to our hearts. Am I exaggerating? When we pray, do we really focus on our hearts? Because that's where prayer is. Because that's where the Holy Spirit lives. We bathe one another in the Holy Spirit. That's why I love being a priest. And here on my iPhone, I get emails all the time asking for prayers. You know what I do with all these prayers? I bring all these people into my heart and bathe them with the Holy Spirit. When they did an autopsy on St. Philip Neri, they found a heart three times the size of a normal human heart. You know why? Because he prayed a lot. That's why. We bring people into our hearts, and we give, to quote Bob Dylan, a shot of love out there in the universe. Better than Star Wars is the shot of love of the Holy Spirit. Give me this water, sir. Go call your husband. I have no husband. Now here's where the Jewish comedian comes in. You're telling me you have no husband. You've had five of them. And the guy you're living with now, he's not your husband. But if she hit with guilt, she's hit with freedom. The truth shall make you free. My sister is very public about her work with AA. Freedom. I'm an alcoholic. 
I've tried to do it myself. I can't do it anymore. I'm going to let go and let God. Truth! You must be a prophet. Where should we worship God? You Jews say Jerusalem. We Samaritans say here at this well. Woman, it makes no difference. True worshipers of the Father will worship neither in Jerusalem or here at this well on this mountain. True worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. God is spirit. And she doesn't know it, but the truth is hitting her right there in the eyeballs. He is the truth. I know. Notice how the water is bubbling up now. Because when we go to the Holy Spirit, our love for Jesus Christ becomes passionate. Isn't that what we Catholics need, brothers and sisters? Passion? Isn't that why so many of our brothers and sisters go to other churches? It's because they need to see passion in us. A passionate love affair. That's what Isaac Hecker had. He had romantic religion. He was passionate about the Christ of Catholicism. I know when the Messiah comes, he will lead us to all truth. The Christ, the Messiah, you're looking at him. I who speak to you now am he. And then she does something what we Catholics practically never do. She evangelizes. She goes out into Samaria and brings Samaritans to a Jewish man, and they stay with him, and he stays with them. And then she disappears. She's on no ego trip. We don't even know her name. She could give a hoot because she wants Christ to shine. Amen? And isn't it interesting that among the very earliest disciples of Jesus Christ, check out Acts of the Apostles, were Samaritans. How did they come to Christ? Through her. That's how. And we don't even know her name. But she wants Christ to shine like St. Paul. I live now no longer I, but Christ lives within me. That's what our people want to see. They want to see Jesus in us. They want to see joy in us. Isn't that what Jesus said yesterday in the gospel? Amen? That your joy may be complete. Why are there so many sad sacks in our pews? People on automatic pilot and cruise control. Gloomy gusses. Why? I think it's because we lack that devotion to the Holy Spirit and that nourishment that comes from the Holy Eucharist when we truly are spirit-filled. Unity, she finds a soulmate. Truth, she knows the truth about herself. She's nobody's partner. She's nobody's second or third spouse or ex. She's a temple of the Holy Spirit. Goodness, I think she's there at the cross. I think she was one of the holy women who followed Jesus because she finds in him not just a soulmate, but a good shepherd who lays down his life as if she were the only person in the world. You know when I met Mother Teresa? I felt I was the only person in line. There were about 500. I was like 403. She treated me as if I were the only person in the whole place because she had that sense of being present because of her love for the real presence. Amen? Isn't that what Christ gives us in the Eucharist? Sacrifice. The Good Shepherd. And finally, beauty. Well, certainly Mother Teresa wouldn't make Glamour magazine. But the Samaritan woman probably would. She can't be ugly Betty with five husbands and a living boyfriend. But ultimately, she'll wind up in a nursing home because ultimately, as St. Augustine would say, oh, beauty so ancient and yet so new. I don't know about you, but something like a Mother Teresa for me was the face of beauty. And there I have, finally, a modern-day Samaritan woman. She kind of looked like Mother Teresa when she came into my church when I was a seminarian in St. Paul the Apostle Church, the Paulist Mother House. That's where I did my internship. And she came in to support Cesar Chavez of the United Farm Workers. Remember Cesar Chavez? Here is this babushka woman who looked like a, a street lady coming in with 2,000 United Farm Workers and their supporters. And there was Geraldo Rivera, a young uh, Puerto Rican, New York, 
reporter in those days for ABC News. And there's Cesar Chavez, and all of a sudden, Cesar stops the action. He says, we have a saint among us. And he points to this woman who just looked ahead. Thunderous applause, she could give a hoot. Dorothy Day. Mother Teresa with a past, Father Elwood Kaiser would say, Paulist, who made a movie about her, Entertaining Angels, which I highly recommend. Here is someone who is a radical socialist who wrote for a communist newspaper, The Wall. There in Greenwich Village, she had various liaisons, some of them anarchists, most of them communists or socialists, one of them an Irish-American playwright, Eugene O'Neill. And one of these liaisons, she conceived a child, and the idiot told her, get rid of, quote, it, unquote. You see the movie, you'll see she has an abortion in the movie. She comes back, and the idiot betrays her. He leaves. She pounds the mirror. But it's not the end, it's the beginning. She follows a hideously looking homeless man to a soup kitchen run by the Sisters of Charity. Feisty Sister Aloysius. Why isn't your church more concerned with the poor? Dorothy Day says. Aloysius says, well, who do you think's here? Open your eyes. And it was the beginning of a new life. Eventually, she's given the Baltimore Catechism. Why did God make us? God made us to know him, love him, and serve him in this life, and to be happy with him forever in the next. And when she came to the part of the mystical body, that was it. We wouldn't need a communist revolution if this outfit, the Catholic Church, ever got its act together. We'd be a revolution. To which I say amen today. And she and the daughter, she did not abort. Tamar Teresa came into the Catholic Church. During the Great Depression, of course, there was no RCIA or Living with the Eucharist program, or Living the Eucharist. She only knew Sister Aloysius. That was her godmother. But she opened up her home for the homeless in the Catholic Worker Movement. And one of the movements that I am privileged to be very close to throughout my years of priesthood has been the Catholic Worker Movement. I even met Dorothy Day's granddaughter, Martha Hennessy. Looks exactly like her. Spitting image. Oh, yes, Dorothy Day. And her whole life was dedicated to nonviolence. Make us instruments of your peace. Will it ever happen, brothers and sisters? Will we ever become truly nonviolent? Hecker had a wonderful friend named Thoreau who protested the war against Mexico because he thought, why are we fighting these Mexicans? They don't have any slavery. So he went to jail because he refused to pay taxes and they jailed him. And so you know what? He wrote a book called On Civil Disobedience, which affected and influenced Gandhi, Cesar Chavez, Martin Luther King, and yes, Dorothy Day. Will it ever happen that domestic violence will end? Will it ever happen that gang warfare will end? Will it ever happen that wars will end? And abortions, and executions, and euthanasia? Will it ever happen? And the answer to that question is it will end if like servant of God, Dorothy Day. We are led by the Spirit and fed by the Eucharist. Dorothy Day would not only receive the Eucharist every single day, but make a holy hour before the Blessed Sacrament every single day of her life. To see the face of Jesus in every face. And even though she went through much, much turmoil, and misunderstanding, her joy was complete. Amen. Please stand. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And may the Lord bless you all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, we have our hospitality now. 
Uh, please pray for our Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters who will be joining us at 8 o'clock for their uh, service. Nick, what do you have for us? You are mine. Perfect. God bless you all. We'll see you tomorrow. We talk about the church, led by the Spirit, fed by the Eucharist, becoming a holy Catholic church.